I recognize I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Make sure to add that. I'm sorry? That's it. You want to make sure to add that. that make does. sure and add that. Yeah, because it adds respect to what you said proceeding. Well, look, man, I live by grace. You don't pursue grace if you're perfect. You pursue, you pursue grace if you're flawed. But you still right. understand. I, I, and, and so, therefore, I'm not, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a carnal man. But I do know this. I do know that this nation okay, was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Now, I can't, I'm not going to change history like some attempt to do. Okay? I'm not going to do that. So I carry this in my pocket. Okay? When people ask me a question similar to you, it makes me think about it. But you're the first group that I pulled it up and shared it with. Okay? So therefore, it's, it's a, uh, and I really believe that if that were the standard for all 535 members of Congress, that the country would be better served. Okay? Because this, and what he made reference to, clearly defines what is true. And clearly defines what values really are. Non-negotiable. No debate. No debate. So, um, yes sir, I promised. Um, first of all, I want to thank you very much. Um, I've been very pleased with your representation so far in your term. Thank you. Um, secondly, my dad, he's a building contractor. As you know, that's horrible. He's barely survived. So my family, we know all about cutting, cutting, sure. you know, overdraft charges at the bank. Right. And um, our nation is pretty much bankrupt, you know, just like many of our families are struggling, our government's probably in worse shape, honestly. They just barely keep things going thanks to borrowing. And our current leadership in the Republican Party, unfortunately, I think it's become clear. I'm not going to ask you to agree with me on this. I don't want to put you in a bad position, but I would to, love that. to me it's become clear that it is part of the establishment ruling class. They don't know how to negotiate. They don't know how to stand up and take a courageous stand on principle. They don't know how to communicate a good message. And I think this year it's pretty much lost as far as getting anything big done because we'll have the same leadership and the elections and politics and everything. But I really think that we need to replace John Banner with Michelle Bachman or Paul Ryan once we get the new Congress. We need Jim DeMint in the Senate. We need people like that leading who are going to take a stand and who are going to make real changes. And um, I would just, I would ask you to maybe speak on that for a minute, share your sure. thoughts, and also to when, if I hope you are reelected, and if you are, to hopefully cast your vote for someone who is going to take a stand and change the direction of our government and our nation. Thank you very much for your comments and your support. I want to say this, um, one of the things that is broken about uh, the way we select our leaders in Washington is the manner in which that's done. I want to walk you through the process. Um, you know, when we're elected the first November, the first week of November, the first Tuesday, um, we immediately are called to Washington to be a part of, of uh, an orientation where we go and, and we learn a lot. It's very educational. We, that's where we learn of where our office is going to be. That's where we, we begin really interviewing for staff positions and, and where we learn about um, you know, how, how everything works. I mean, keys and doors and where, where uh, we're, we're beginning to learn where our committee assignments are. But one of the things that we do is we attend as freshmen. Uh, now, we remember, we've not been sworn in yet. We're not sworn in to the 1st of January. Uh, so it's November. It's a week after the election, and it, it's somewhat euphoric. You, you've just been through, you know, an 18-month campaign where you've worked 20-hour days. You, you just, you, you burn the midnight oil, you, you know, and then it's culminated, and, and, and you were fortunate enough to have the people select you. So you go to Washington, and then you attend what is called the conference. And on the Democratic side, they call it the caucus. And each week, the Democratic caucus meets, and each week, the Republican conference meets. And so when you go into the conference, <coughs> it's, 
it really is a, an awe-inspiring experience. I mean, you're ushered in, and you're sitting there in a room, you know, and for me, it was with 242 other members of Congress uh, in the Republican conference, and you're just in awe. You're like, I mean, these are, these are the people, all the names you mentioned, and, and, uh, and, and a lot of others that, that you've watched, and you've admired, and you've, you've just, that's really that guy, and then, you know, and they're coming up to you. It's really, it's really an amazing experience. And even though it's an amazing experience and it's, it's, it's good to be there, it is probably not the very best day for a freshman member of Congress to probably have to make the most important vote in his first term. Because I got all this other stuff. I'm trying to figure out where the bathrooms are. And it's the same way with, 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 I mean, with any freshman, whether they're Democrat or Republican. You have to come in and say, hey, this is the guy we're going to follow, or this is the, the lady we're going to follow, or this, wait, I need some information. I, I, I got to do my due diligence. I got I to gotta do my homework before we make this incredibly difficult, I mean, incredibly important vote. So, and let me, I don't say that because I, I disagree you know, with, with, with my leadership. I say that because I don't like that process. And I have found that bad process oftentimes <coughs> leads to bad decisions. Mom used to tell me growing up, hurry's not of the devil. It is the devil. And she also told me there ain't nothing good going on after midnight. <laughs> And so on the first big CR, I couldn't tell me what was in the bill. We got to hurry up and do this. It's 12:20. So I'm sitting on the floor of the house, and I'm holding that voting card, and I can promise you this: the only thing I'm thinking about is how fortunate I am to have a mama like I got. So I voted no. After midnight, in a hurry. I default to no. So my point is, is that process that both the Democrats and the Republicans use to select leadership in a hurry, I don't like the process. Now, I understand sometimes, I mean, I've had them explain to me why they do it, because obviously there's a lot that has to get done between then and, and, and but I don't like the process. I don't like that we are put in a, in, a, in a position to have to make such an important decision. Now, let me say this regarding uh, Speaker Boehner. You know, I've disagreed with Speaker Boehner. Uh, when I felt that we needed to go a different direction and we needed a different plan. And I felt that my, my uh, loyalty when it comes to that are to those that I serve. It's a neat thing about a representative form of government. You are my priority, not my leadership. You are my priority. And if you don't have me stand up for you, you think some congressman in California will? No. No. No, because the way our founding fathers drew it up is that he's taking care of representing his people while I was here taking care and representing my people. So therefore, it is incumbent for me, if I want to establish integrity and trust between you and I, that I disagree with even my own leadership when I do not believe that that's what my, rep my people want me to do. So I think John Boehner is in the most difficult job in all of Washington, D.C. He, he has a, a partner on the other side of the Capitol that hasn't passed a budget in over a thousand days. A thousand days. We've got 30, over 30 now, over 30 jobs bills sitting on his desk that we have had, bipartisan, by the way. Not all partisan bills, but, but, but some, some, some bipartisan bills that are sitting on his desk to create jobs, and he's tabled. So John Boehner's got to deal with Harry Reid, and then he has to work with the president. And even though I disagree with the president, and I disagree with his vision and his policies, I'm still going to respect the office. Because the office is bigger than Barack Obama. The office was bigger than George Bush. The office is about the people. So I'm going to disagree, and I'm going to battle him, and I'm going to do so with my values intact. And by the way, when you talk about values, you get that brochure, 
It'll have seven values on there. First of all, we value freedom, our office. And we value respect, discipline, excellence, honesty, courage, and loyalty. Those are our values. And they're non-negotiable. So I, 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 I disagree with the speaker. I've done so where I have still remained, I think, a, 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 have a good relationship with him. He has supported me, and I've supported him when he's right. Um, so there's a right way and a wrong way to disagree. And I have done so with my respect, self-respect intact, and so, you know, and I'll continue to do that. But I, but I hear you. I, look, let me tell you what we've got to have in Washington, D.C. We don't need more information. God knows we got all the information we need. What we need is we need more backbone. Yeah. We need people that, that, that have identified right. And I'll tell you, most of them have identified what is right and what is wrong. And we need the backbone and the courage to say our people back home and the American dream is more important to us than the inside the beltway way of life. And I got to tell you, it just doesn't appeal to me like, like, like uh, you know, the life we have here. I mean, I, I enjoy the opportunity to serve. Other than the successes in my marriage with Susan and the girls, and by the way, I married a girl I started first grade with. Okay? All right, I'm pretty steady at it. <laughs> so is Susan. We have four daughters that are the light of our life. Um, and, um, and we're going to give them the security and the safety and the opportunity and the encouragement that Susan's parents gave her and that my parents gave me. Our children deserve nothing else. Um, and, and so other than the successes of our marriage, though, and our family, man, the, the opportunity to serve the men and women of Florida's 2nd Congressional District is the greatest honor I've ever been, been given. I mean, I, there's only been 11,000 individuals serve in the House of Representatives since we became a nation. It's, it's, a, it's very special. And I, I thank you very much for the opportunity that you've given me. Yes, sir. Final question. Okay. Well, I'm out of Now, how do we change all that? First well, of all, first of all, let me thank go you. ahead. First of all, we got to get you reelected. <laughs> well, thank you. Secondly, I'd love to hear that. Secondly, you need to uh, get somebody up there in the place that's going to come up. And hopefully, we have a new president. We've been working on grassroots, fundamental level of uh, working with Republicans in Tallahassee. And I have been stunned at how disorganized the local uh, Republican Party is. In our precinct, we have no precinct yet. And uh, Laura's been real good about trying. I can't even get a list of Republicans, uh, an accurate list of the Republicans in our precinct. We want to get them funding them. We want to make sure that they're all above. And, and, you know, if we get the change in the leadership of the Senate and a lead out of there, I think things will begin to... Well, let me, let me, and I want to be very fair. Uh, first of all, thank you for your kind words, and I agree with everything you just said. Um, I think that, um, but I also want to be, we are in this mess we are in, uh, and the Republicans have some blame here. Okay, they have a lot of blame. So I want to make sure that, 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 that you, you hear from me that I am fair in, in my summation of where we are. You see, I see that we, the Republicans, uh, a party that, that better represents my values to me personally uh, and what I want and what I expect in, in, from government, um, you know, in, in regarding you know, government's role, the federal government's role, the state's role, uh, our defense, and a lot of, a lot of things. But I, I feel that, that under, under the previous administration, you know, our government grew by a massive amount uh, in a way that, that is not healthy for the federal government. Because I believe that the states should be doing more and that the federal government should be doing less and that there's more of a balance. You see, I, I do believe that when President Reagan said government governs best when it governs closest to the people, I believe he was right. He also said government governs best when it governs least. Okay? So let's check the box. Let's go to Article 1, Section 8, and let's see 
what does the Constitution say the federal government is supposed to do? And then let's look at the Tenth Amendment that says that anything that's not listed in Article One, Section 8, that falls to the state's responsibility. Simple. I think that the federal government is trampling on the 50 states. And those are little, I mean, those are, those are greenhouses of ideas, of, of, of best practices that really need to be adopted at the federal level. When there's a great idea in Arizona, well, we need to adopt that and implement that on the federal level. When it's a great idea in, in, in New York, maybe that's an idea that we could apply to the federal. And I'm talking about efficiencies now. I'm talking about the way government does business. But what we've done is the federal government has just taken so much power, so much authority away from the states. I ran on the Tenth Amendment. I believe in the Tenth Amendment. And so I'm working hard to push authority back to the states. Because I believe that the states, the people in Tallahassee are Floridians. And Floridians know best what other Floridians need. Not bureaucrats, a thousand miles away, who've never even perhaps been to Florida. So I, I agree with you, and uh, on campaign issues, I would be happy uh, to, to, to talk with you after, uh, after we're done. Um, I, 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 um, and I, I share, but I do share with you, uh, there are some elections that are coming up that are very, very critical. Um, and um, you know, I think that our Senate race is certainly one of the most important races in the country. Uh, and I think, obviously, the White House. Uh, yes, ma'am, you've been very patient. Uh, okay. um, I want to kind of mention a couple of things. I, I don't know if you understand about the no cash, no cash policy. Uh, I wrote a little something that says, across the nation, no cash policy for businesses are becoming increasingly popular. And this trend is catching on here in Tallahassee and Leonard County. According to the Merchant's Account Guide, experts contend the cashless or electronic transfer transactions are becoming more popular with consumers and vendors. Furthermore, this online publication asserts that making purchases with credit cards or debit cards has become the rule for fast, secure internet transactions as well as brick and mortar businesses. My question and concern is what happens to those citizens that do not have credit or debit cards or those who live on fixed income and cannot afford to lose their hard earned income on purchasing money orders to conduct businesses. Money is a sign and measure of values because it is known, acknowledged, and accepted everywhere. It is a universal commodity, while it, at the same time, affords each country its local instrument for purchase, sale, and remuneration for both public and private services. Paper currency or legal tender is a medium of payment allowed by law or recognized by a legal system to be valid for meeting a financial obligation. Is it accepted all over the world and written on the bill is legal tender for all debts, public and private. By removing currency, there is a danger that in the very moment, by calling it to its aid, the magic of credit, since power of the people are inclined to exaggerate. This is my notory sorry, trans transactions to mention proportion as civilized advance of credit is extended. Let us by an extreme hypothesis suppose ourselves in a society in which the use of paper money has entirely disappeared. If we should go beyond this, as paper money does not unite in itself the characters both of sign and help pledge, and it does not become a commodity when it ceases to be a means of discharge from debt. The danger exists when a private institution is granted the dangerous privilege which excuses its use as payment. Today, I paraphrase a quotation from Chris, who wrote in the beginning of the 16th century on this important question in a treaty that is almost unknown. <coughs> However innumerable, the scourges of problems that ordinarily lead to the decline of kingdoms, principalities, republics, before following are to mind the most formidable dis discard Precedence, barrenness of the land, and deterioration of money. As far as the first three are concerned, the evidence is such that no one is ignorant of them. But as the fourth, if we accept a few men of superior intelligence, very few concern themselves about it. And why? Because it does not ruin the state at a single blow, but little by little, by a 
sort of hidden action. The diversity and variations of money was one of the causes that led to the establishment of a bank of deposit, which reduced these uncertain signs to a common denomination by creating bank money fixing and variable, which took into consideration the value of the species deposit. The notes issued were- Can I ask you, stop just one second. You just turned the page again. Uh -huh. yeah, I wanna, I wanna, I, I can, I can, I mean, I wanna, I don't know how many pages, but it's stapled to several others, so. I mean, I will, I don't want to, right. I want to address your issue, okay, okay? Uh, and, uh, and at the same time, I want to be fair to the other residents uh, that are here. Okay. So, I'm, I'm assuming, after listening to the first two and a half pages, that your, your, your problem is that some institutions, private institutions, are not taking cash. Well, okay? it's utility companies. Okay, they, I understand. They have monopolies. No, I understand. You cannot that's, shop. That's a start. What's going? What's happening is we're going to a cashless society. No, I understand, but 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 let me say this: you know, you, you have a choice. On most businesses, you have a choice. Now, on a, on a public utility, I agree, you, you're limited in your options. Okay, but if you go to if you go to a dry cleaners, and a dry cleaner refuses to take your you cash, well, you vote with your dollar. Okay, okay. But I'm here to advance freedom, and if that dry cleaner, if it's more profitable for them to be able to do what they do and they take credit cards and debit cards and they choose not, it's a freedom issue for them. Right. It's a private company, okay? So, the utility company I, 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 think I, made, I think I made it very clear that the utility company <laughs> is, is something that, that you don't have a lot of options on, okay? But, but I wanna be very clear in, my, in my, my answer regarding most businesses. When you have options, okay? If Burger King decides to not take cash anymore, well then they, they can experience the benefit of maybe some, some uh, some some expeditious accounting, but they're probably going to lose you and your family because you're going to go down the street and buy, you know, a Big Mac because you're not going to wait in line for a Whopper for a place that won't take your cash. And you have that right. In other words, their policy does not harm you as if, but you don't have a choice on a utility. You don't have a, you know, if you got to say, hey, if I don't deal with this utility, I don't have power. That's a different... It's a different bird. And so I want to make sure that we address most companies because in your comments there, you started addressing into private, that could be interpreted as private companies. And at no point in time in my family business do I want the government to tell me how I can be paid. That's a freedom issue. But certain public utilities, okay, who operate uh, uh, with government, with a part, it, it's almost quasi-government in many ways because they work with the government. Uh, they perhaps don't enjoy some of the things that maybe I may enjoy as, as a privately held family business. So I would view them as separate entities. So, um, you know, so I, I probably agree with some of what you're saying regarding these public utilities, but I would probably disagree with some of that because I, I do not believe, because I believe you have a choice. Mm -hmm. And if that's a company that doesn't take cash, then they're probably just, they've made a decision that your business is not worth to them what maybe another company has. Now me and my businesses, man, I'll take cash. I mean, we still honor cash. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, in God we trust. And on any document that states that, we'll, we'll, we'll take that. So, you know, um, so my businesses uh, will, will always be an option for you. But, uh, but, uh, but others, but I also don't want to, I don't, I don't want to take the right away from others to run their business as they deem fit. As long as their policy doesn't infringe upon the rights of others. And I think utilities would fit in that category. Um, and I and you're not the first person that has mentioned that. So right. so I would I would tend to agree with you regarding uh, the convenience factor and and uh, and some people you shouldn't have to buy money orders and you yeah. shouldn't have to and I, I can agree with that. So um, you know and I'm happy to continue to, to talk with you. Uh, that does seem like that's a state issue as opposed maybe to because I know the utilities. Well, the federal act from 1965 does it does not mandate them because sure. they're considered a private company. Okay. But that's what I want to change. I want yeah. to change the law. Yeah, no, I, I, and I'm happy to talk with you about that. Okay. So, all right, folks. Can I just say one more thing about our do-nothing congressman, particularly in the Senate? In Florida, you 
are you may be removed from office for misfeasance, malfeasance, neglect of duty, and nonfeasance. The governor can remove public officials for those four reasons besides committing crimes and whatever. Do we have anything like that in the United States uh, code? And could we use that to remove these officials who are not doing their duties in Congress? Well, I think, let me say this, I think the House, I can't imagine anything, I mean, we can't change light bulbs up there uh, within, you know, two, within a month. Uh, so it's amazing to me, so I can't imagine us being able to remove a, you know, a House member, um, you know, because we run every two years. I mean, so you can, you can literally, uh, you know, impeach a member of Congress every two years. <laughs> yeah, at the ballot, at the ballot. the Senate? No, 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 but the Senate, you know, they're there for six years, so, you know, you can, uh, you know, obviously a, Obviously, a, um, a process such as uh, removing an officer, I mean, uh, removing an official uh, from the Senate, uh, you've got time. So you could, you could certainly, you could certainly do But I don't know to answer your question. I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't, uh, um, you know, I, I, but I mean, I, I understand a recall. It's an idea. Yeah, it's an idea, man. All right, last question. Yeah, I, uh, on your 10th Amendment and the water, the EPA on Florida, mm -hmm. All the governor had to do was say to the EPA, I'm not complying with this. You're in violation of the 10th Amendment. Take a walk. Well, the governor's the chief of the state. It's well, a violation. You know, I think that uh, the, 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 the federal government has, uh, um, federal government has uh, other ways and means to, uh, uh, which oftentimes I disagree with, to, uh, uh, to, to, to make you do things that uh, states don't want to do. Uh, they, there's... There's a, um, so I don't know if that, I don't know if that is, is, is feasible. I know the governor disagrees, let me say this. I know yeah. the governor disagrees, I've had a conversation with him. I know he disagrees with uh, what Lisa Jackson and the EPA has done. Um, I know that your, your, every, the members of the Florida House voted unanimously in agreement uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with our belief, as well as unanimous in the Senate. So, uh, so the legislature, both Republican and Democrat, we as Floridians agree uh, that uh, don't push down a, a rule that, in our opinion, violates the 10th Amendment. What I'm saying is they'll put it down on every state. Yeah. And then you end up Supreme Court, judges, trials, lawyers, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> hey, this is Florida, folks. Yeah. We take care of our own water. You go take care of your water. Well, let me say this, and it is further complicated because we have rivers that flow.